landscape theology and an international language instructor. In my the previous video, I brought the biography of Jhumpa Lahiri. You can collect more and more videos that regarding the English language and literature. So, the please be the kind enough to subs subscribe to the channels that does get TRGFCML and click on the bell icon to get the latest videos soon. In this video clip, that you can listen to the short story now, Interpret of the Melodies by Jhumpa Lahiri. Interpret of Melodies by Jhumpa Lahiri. At the tea stall, Mr. and Mrs. Das bickered about who should take the tailor to the toilet. Eventually, Mrs. Das relented when Mr. Das pointed out that he had given the girl her bath the night before. In the rear view mirror, Mr. Kapasi watched as Mrs. Das emerged slowly from his the bulky white ambassador, dragging her shaved largely bare legs across the back seat. She did not hold the little girl's hand as they walked to the restroom. They were on their way to see the Sun Temple at Konarak. It was a dry, bright Saturday. The mid-July heat tempered by a steady ocean breeze ideal weather for sightseeing. Ordinarily, Mr. Kapasi would not have stopped so soon along the way, but less than five minutes after he'd picked up the family that morning in front of the Hotel Sandy Villa, the little girl had complained. The first thing that Mr. Kapasi had noticed when he saw Mr. and Mrs. Das standing with their children under the portico of the hotel was that they, they were very young, perhaps not even 30. In addition to Tina, they had two boys, Ronnie and Bobby who appeared very close in age and had teeth covered in a network of flashing silver wires. The family looked Indian but dressed as foreigners did. The children in stiff, brightly colored clothing and caps with translucent visas. Mr. Kapasi was accustomed to foreign tourists. He was the assigned to them the regularly because the, he could speak the English. Yesterday, he had driven an elderly couple from Scotland, both with spotted faces and fluffy white hair so thin it exposed their sunburnt scalps. In the comparison, the tanned, youthful faces of Mr. and Mrs. Das were all the more striking. When he'd introduced himself, Mr. Kapasi had pressed his palms together in the greeting but Mr. Das squeezed the hands like an American so that Mr. Kapasi felt it in his elbow. Mrs. Das, for her part, had flexed one side of her mouth, smiling dutifully at Mr. Kapasi without displaying any interest in him. As they waited at the tea, stall, Ronnie, who looked like the older of the two boys, clambered suddenly out of the back seat, intrigued 
by a goat tied to a stake in the ground don't touch it mr das said he glanced up the from his paper back to a book which said india in yellow letters and looked as if it had been published abroad his voice somehow tentative and a little shrill sounded as though it had not yet settled into maturity i want to give it a piece of gum the boy called back as he trotted ahead mr das stepped out of the car and stretched his legs by squatting briefly to the ground a clean shaven man he looked exactly like a magnified version of ronnie he had a sapphire blue visor and was the dressed in shorts uh, sneakers and a t-shirt the camera the slung around his the neck the width and impressive tele photo lens and numerous the buttons and markings was the only complicated thing he wore he frowned watching as the ronnie rushed toward the god but appeared to have no intention of intervening Bobby make the sure that your brother doesn't do anything stupid I don't feel like that Bobby said not moving he was sitting in the front seat beside Mr Capasi studying a picture of the elephant god taped to the glove compartment no need to worry Mr Capasi said they are quite tame mr kapasi was the 46 years old with receding hair and had gone completely silver but his butter scotch complexion and his unlined brow which he treated in a spare the moments to dabs of lotus oil balm made it easy to imagine what he must have looked like at an earlier age he wore gray trousers and a matching jacket style shirt tapered at the waist with the short sleeves and a large pointed collar made of a thin but durable synthetic material he had specified both the cut and the fabric to his the tailor it was his preferred uniform for giving to us because it did not get crushed during his the long hours the behind the wheel through the windshield he watched as the ronnie circled around the goat touched it quickly on its side then trotted back to the car you left india as a child mr kapasi asked the wind mr dust had settled once again into the passenger seat oh mina and i the were both born in america mr dust announced with an air of a sudden confidence born and raised our parents they live here now in asansol they retired we visit them every couple year he turned to watch as the little girl ran toward the car the white purple balls of her sundress pluffing on her narrow brown shoulders she was holding to her chest a doll with yellow hair that looked as if it 
had been chopped as a punitive mission with a pair of dull scissors. This is the Tina's the first trip to India, isn't it, Tina? I don't have to go to the bathroom anymore, Tina announced. Where is Mina? Mr. Das asked. Mr. Kapasi found it strange that Mr. Das should refer to his wife by her first name when speaking to the little girl. Tina pointed to where uh, Mr. Mrs. Das was uh, purchasing something from the one of the shirtless men who worked at the tea stall. Mr. Kapasi heard one of the shirtless men sing a phrase from a popular Hindi love song as Mrs. Das walked back to the car. But she did not appear to understand the words of the song, for she did not express irritation or embarrassment or react in any other way to the man's declarations. He observed her. She wore a red and white checkered skirt that stopped above her knees, slip on shoes with a square the wooden heel and a close the fitting blouse styled like a man's undershirt. The blouse was decorated at the chest level with a calico applique in the shape of a strawberry. She was a short woman with small hands like paws, her frosty pink finger nails painted to match her lips and was the slightly the plump in her figure. Her hair shone only a little longer than her husband's was parted far to one side. She was wearing the large dark brown sunglasses with a pink uh, kish tint to them and carried a big straw the bag almost as big as her torso, shaved like a bowl, with a water, the bottle the poking out of it, she walked slowly, carrying some of the puffed rice that tossed with the peanuts and the chili peppers in a large packet made from newspapers. Mr. Kapasi turned to Mr. Mr. Das. Where in America do you live? New Brunswick, New Jersey, next to New York. Exactly. I teach middle school there. What subject? Science. In fact, every year I take my students on a trip to the Museum of Natural History in New York City. In a way, we have a lot in common. You could say, you and I. How long have you been a tour guide, Mr. Kapasi? Five years. Mrs. Das reached the car. How long is the trip? She asked, the, shutting the door. About two and a half hours, Mr. Kapasi replied. At this, Mrs. Das gave an impatient sigh, as if she had been traveling her whole life without pause. She fanned herself with a folded Bombay filled magazine written in English. I thought that the Sun Temple is the only 18 miles the north of a Puri. Mr. Das said, tapping on the tour book. The roads to Konarak are poor. Actually, it is a distance of 52 miles. Mr. Kapasi explained. Mr. Das nodded, readjusting 
the camera strap where it had begun to chafe the back of his neck. Before starting the ignition, Mr. Kapasi reached back to make the sure the crank like the locks on the inside of each of the back the doors that were secured. As soon as the car began to move, the little girl began to play with the lock on her side, clicking it with some effort forward and backward, but Mrs. Das said nothing to stop her. She sat a bit slouched at one end of the back seat, not offering her puffed rice to any more. Ronnie and Tina sat on either side of her, both snapping bright green gum. Look, Bobby said uh, as the car began to gather speed. He pointed with his finger to the tall the trees that lined the road. Look, monkeys, Ronnie shrieked. Wow! They were seated in the groups along the branches with the shining the black the faces, silver bodies, horizontal eyebrows and the crested heads. They are the long, the grey, the tails, the dangled like a series of robes among the leaves. A few scratched themselves with the black, the leathery hands or swung their feet, staring as the car passed. We call them the Hanuman, Mr. Kapasi said. They are quite common in the area. As soon as the he spoke, the one of the monkeys the leaped into the middle of the road, causing Mr. Kapasi to break the subtly. Another bounced onto the hood of the car, then they sprang away. Mr. Kapasi beeped his horn. The children began to get excited, sucking in their the breath and covering their faces partly with their hands. They had never seen the monkeys outside of a zoo. Mr. Das explained. He asked Mr. Kapasi to stop the car so that he could take a picture. While Mr. Das adjusted his te telephoto lens, Mrs. Das reached into her straw bag and pulled out a bottle of colorless the nail polish, which she proceeded to stroke the, on the tip of her index finger. The little girl stuck out a hand, mine too, mommy, to mine too. Leave me alone, Mrs. Das said, blowing on her nail and turning her body slightly. You are making me mess up. The little girl occupied herself by buttoning and unbuttoning a Pena four on the doll's the plastic body. All set, Mr. Das said, replacing the lens cap. The car rattled considerably as it raced along the dusty road, causing them all to pop up from their seats every now and then. But Mrs. Das continued to polish her nails. Mr. Kapasi eased up on the accelerator, hoping to produce a smoother ride. When he reached for the gear shift, the boy in front accommodated him by swinging his hairless knee out of the way. Mr. Kapasi noted that this the boy was the slightly paler than the other children. Daddy 
why is the driver sitting on the wrong side in this car too the boy asked they all do that to hear the dummy ronnie said don't call your brother a dummy mr da said he turned to mr kapasi in america you know it confuses them oh yes i'm well aware mr kapasi said as delicately as he could he shifted gears again accelerating as they approached a hill in the road i see it on dallas the steering wheels that are on the left hand side what's the dallas tina asked banging her now naked doll on the seat behind mr kapasi it went off the air mr das explained it is a television show they were all like the siblings mr kapasi thought as they passed a row of a date trees mr and mrs das behaved like an older brother and the sister not parents it seemed that they were in charge of the children only for the day it was the hard to believe they were regular responsible for anything other than themselves mr das the tabbed on his the lens cap and his the tour book dragging his thumbnail occasionally across the pages so that they made a scraping sound oh mrs das the continued to polish her nails as she had still not removed her sunglasses every now when then tina renewed her plea that she wanted her nails done too and so at one point mrs das the flicked a drop of polish on the little girl's the finger before depositing the bottle back inside her straw bag is in this the end air condition car she asked is still blowing on the on her hand the window on the tina side was broken and they could not be rolled down quit complaining mr da said it isn't so hot i told you to get a car with the air conditioning mrs da continued why do you do this raj just to save a few stupid rupees what are you saving us 50 cents their accents the sounded just like the ones the mr kapasi heard on american television programs though not like the ones on dallas this need to get to tyson mr kapasi showing people the same thing every day Mr. Das the ass the rolling down his the on the window all the way hey do you mind stopping the car i just want to get a shot of this guy mr kapasi pulled over to the side of the road as uh, mr das uh, took a picture of a barefoot man his head wrapped in a dirty turban seated on top of a cart of grain sacks pulled by a pair of bullocks both the man and the bullocks were emaciated in the back seat mrs das the gazed out another window at this sky the where the nearly transparent the clouds the passed quickly the in front of the one another i look forward to it actually as mr kapasi said as they the continued on their way the sun temple is the one of my the favorite places 
In that way, it is a reward for me. I give the tours on Fridays and Saturdays only. I have another job during the week. Oh, where? Mr. Das asked. I work in a doctor's office. You are a doctor. I am not a doctor. I work with one as an interpreter. What does a doctor need an interpreter for? He has a number of the Gujarati patients. My father was the Gujarati, but many uh, people they do not uh, speak the Gujarati in this area, including the doctor. And so the doctor asked me to work in his office, interpreting the, what the patients say. Interesting. I have never heard of anything like that, Mr. Das said. Mr. Kapasi shrugged. It is a job that like any other. But so romantic, Mrs. Das said dreamily. Breaking her extended silence, she lifted her pinkish the brown sunglasses and arranged them on the top of her head like a tiara. For the first time, her eyes met Mr. Kapasi's in the rare view the mirror, pale, a bit small, their gaze the fixed but drowsy. Uh, Mr. Das craned to look at her. What is so romantic about it? I don't know something, she shrugged, knitting her brows together for an instant. Would you like a piece of gum, Mr. Kapasi? She asked brightly. She reached into her straw bag and handed him a small square wrapped in a green and white striped paper. As soon as Mr. Kapasi put the gum in his mouth, a thick, sweet liquid burst onto his tongue. Tell us the more about your job, Mr. Kapasi, Mrs. Das said. What would you like to know, madam? I don't know. She, uh, she shrugged. Munching on some the puffed rice and licking the mustard oil from the corners of her mouth. Till as a typical situation, she she settled back in her seat, her head her head tilted in the patch of sun, and closed her eyes. I want to picture what happens. Very well. The other day, a man came in with a pain in his throat. Did he smoke cigarettes? No. It was very curious. He complained that he felt as if there were long pieces of his straw stuck in his throat. When I told the doctor, he was able to prescribe the proper medication. That is so neat. Yes, Mr. Kapasi agreed after some hesitation. So, these the patients are totally dependent on you, Mrs. Das said. She spoke the slowly as if she were thinking aloud, in a way more dependent on you than the doctor. How do you mean, how could it be? Well, for example, you could tell the doctor that the pain felt like a burning, not a straw. The patient would never know what you had told the doctor, and the doctor wouldn't know that you had told the wrong thing. It is a big responsibility. Yes, a big responsibility you have there, Mr. Kapasi. Mr. Das agreed. Mr. Kapasi had never thought of his the job in such a complimentary terms. To, to him, it was a thankless occupation. He found nothing noble in interpreting people's the maladies.
assiduously, translating the symptoms of so many swollen bones, countless the cramps of bellies and the bowels, spots on the people's the palms that change color, shape or size. The doctor, nearly half his age, had an affinity for bell button trousers and made humorous jokes about the Congress the party. Together they worked in a stale little infirmary where Mr. Kapasi's smartly tailored clothes that clung to him in the heat in spite of the blackened blades of a ceiling fan churning over their heads. The job was a sign of his failings. In his youth he had been a devoted scholar of the foreign languages. The owner of an impressive collection of dictionaries, he had a dream of the being an interpreter for diplomats and dignitaries, resolving the conflicts between the people and nations, uh, settling the disputes of which he alone could understand both sides. He was a self-educated man. In a series of notebooks, in the evenings before his parents settled his marriage, he had listed the common etymologies of words and at one point in his life he was confident that he could converse. If given the opportunity in English, French, Russian, Portuguese, and Italian, not to mention Hindi, Bengali, Orissi, and Gujarati. Now only a handful of European phrases remained in his memory, scattered words for things like the sauces and the chairs, the English, the voice, the only the non-Indian language he spoke the fluently anymore. Uh, Mr. Kapasi knew it was not a remarkable talent. Sometimes he feared that his children knew the better English than he did. Just from the watching television, still, it came in handy for the tours. He had taken the job as an interpreter after his first son at the age of seven contracted typhoid. That was how he had first made the acquaintance the, of the doctor. At the time, Mr. Kapasi had been teaching English in a grammar school and he bartered his uh, skills as an interpreter to pay the increasingly exorbitant uh, medical bills. In the end, the boy had died one evening in his mother's arms his uh, limbs the burning with fear, but then there was the funeral to pay for, and the other children who were the born soon enough, and the never the bigger house, and the good schools and tutors, and the fine the shoes, and the television and the countless the other ways that he tried to console his the wife and to keep her from the crying in her sleep. And so, when the doctor offered to pay him the twice as much as he earned at the school, at the grammar school, he accepted. Mr. Kapasi, he knew that his wife had little the regard for his the career as an interpreter. He knew it reminded her of the son she had lost and that she resented the other lives that he helped. 
it is the only small way to save if ever she referred to his position. She used the phrase the doctor's assistant, as if the process of interpretation were equal to taking someone's temperature or changing a bedpan. She never asked him about the patients who came to the doctor's office or said that his the job was a big responsibility. For this reason, it flattered Mr. Kapasi that Mrs. Dust was so intrigued by his the job, unlike his the wife, that she had reminded him of its the intellectual challenges. She had also used the word romantic that she did not behave in a romantic way toward her husband, and yet she had used the word to describe him. He wondered if Mr. and Mrs. Das were a bad match, just as he and his the wife were. Perhaps that they too had little in the common apart from the three children and a decade of their lives. The signs that he recognized from his the old marriage were there, the bickering, the indifference, the protracted silences. Her sudden interest in him and interest that she did not express in either her husband or her children was mildly intoxicated. When Mr. Kapasi thought once again about how she had said romantic, the feeling of intoxication grew. He began to check his reflection in the Rare view the mirror as he drew, the feeling the grateful that he had chosen the grey suit that uh, morning and not the brown one which tended to sag a little in the knees. From time to time he glanced through the mirror at uh, Mrs. Das. In addition to gla glancing at her face, he glanced at the strawberry between her breasts. And the golden brown hollow in her throat, he decided to tell the Mrs. The Dust about another patient and another, the young woman who had complained of a sensation of raindrops in her spine. The gentleman whose birthmark had begun to sprout hairs. Mrs. Dust listened attentively, strokingly, stroking her hair, though with a small plastic brush that resembled an oval bed of nails, asking more questions for yet another example. The children were quite intent on spotting the more monkeys in the trees, and Mr. Dust was absorbed by his the tour book, so it seemed like a private conversation between Mr. Kapasi and Mrs. Dust in this manner. The next half over the past and when they stopped for lunch at a roadside restaurant that sold fritters and omelette sandwiches, the usually something Mr. Kapasi looked forward to on his tours so that he could sit in peace and enjoy some hot tea. He was disappointed as the does a family settled together under a magenta umbrella fringed with the white and orange tassels and placed their orders with one of the waiters who marched about in uh, triconed caps by Mr. Kapasi reluctantly headed toward a neighboring table. 
Mr. Kapasi, wait. There is the room here, Mrs. Das called out. She gathered Tina onto her lap, insisting that he accompany them, and so together they had a bottled mango juice and sandwiches and plates of onions and potatoes that deep fried in gram flour batter. After finishing two omelette sandwiches, Mr. Das took more pictures of the group as they ate. How much longer, he asked Mr. Kapasi, as he paused to load a new roll of film in the camera. About half an hour more. By now, the children had gotten up the, from the table to look at the more monkeys that perch in a nearby tree. So there was a considerable space between the Mrs. The Dust and the Mr. Kapasi. Mr. Dust placed the camera to his the face and he squeezed the one eye shut, his the tongue exposed at one corner of his the mouth. This looks the funny, Mina. You need to lean in closer to Mr. Kapasi. She did. He could smell a scent on her skin, like a mixture of the whiskey and the rose water. He worried suddenly that she could smell his perspiration, which he knew had collected beneath the synthetic material of his shirt. He polished off his mango juice in the one gulp and smoothed his silver hair with his hands, a bit of the juice that dripped onto his chin. He wondered if Mrs. Dust had noticed. She had not. What is your address, Mr. Kapasi? She inquired, fishing for something inside her straw bag. You would like my address? So we can send you copies, she said, of the pictures. She handed him a scrap of a paper which she had hastily ribbed from a page of a field magazine. The blank the portion was the limited. For the narrow strip that was the crowded by lines of a text and a tiny picture of a hero and a heroine embracing the under a eucalyptus the tree. The paper that curled as Mr. Kapasi the rotis the address in clear the careful letters she would write to him the asking about his the days the interpreting at the doctor's office and he would respond eloquently choosing the only the most entertaining the anecdotes ones that would make her laugh out loud as she read them in her house in new jersey in time that she would reveal the disappoint disappointment of her marriage and he his uh, in this the way their friendship that would grow and uh, flourish he would uh, possess a picture of the two of them the eating the fried onions the under uh, mag magenta umbrella which he the would keep he decided safely the tucked between the pages of his the Russian grammar. As is the mind raised, Mr. Kapasi experienced a mild and pleasant shock. It was a similar to a feeling he used to experience the long ago when, after months of translating with the aid of a dictionary, he would finally read a passage from a French novel or an Italian sonnet and understand the words the one after another. Un 
encumbered by his own efforts, in those the moments Mr. Kapasi used to believe that all was the right with the world, that uh, all the struggles that were rewarded, that all of the lives, the mistakes, the made sense the, in the end. The promise that he would hear from Mrs. Das now filled him with the same belief. When he finished the writing his address, Mr. Kapasi handed her the paper. But as soon as he did so, he worried that he had either misspelled his name or accidentally reversed the, the numbers of his postal code. He dreaded the possibility of a lost letter, the photograph never reaching him hovering the somewhere in Orissa, close the but ultimately unattainable. He thought of asking for the slip of paper again just to make sure he had written his address accurately but Mrs. Dust had already dropped it into the jumble of her bag. They reached the corner rack at 2.30. The temple they made of sandstone was a massive pyramid-like structure in the shape of a chariot. It was dedicated to the great master of life, the sun, which struck three sides of the edifice as it made its journey each day across the sky. Twenty-four giant wheels were carved on the north and the south sides of the plinth. The wall, the whole thing was drawn by a team of seven horses speeding as if the, through the heavens. As they approached, Mr. Kapasi explained that the temple had been built between um, 1243 and 255 AD with the efforts of 1200 artisans by the great ruler of the Ganga dynasty, the king Nara see how they were the first to commemorate his the victory against the Muslim army. It says the temple occupies about 170 acres of land, Mr. Das, the say, they reading from his book. It is like a desert, Ronnie said, his eyes the wandering across the sand that is stretched on all sides the beyond the temple, the Chandra Bhag River once the flowed one mile north of here. It is the dry now, Mr. Kapasi said, turning off the engine. They got out and walked toward the temple, the pausing uh, first four pictures by the pair of lions that flanked the steps. Uh, Mr. Kapasi led them next to one of the wheels of the chariot higher than any human being nine feet in diameter the wheels are supposed to symbolize the wheel of life mr das read they depict the cycle of creation persuasion and achievement of realization cool he turned the page of his book. Each wheel is divided into eight thick and thin spokes, the dividing the day into eight equal parts. The rims are carved with the designs of the birds and animals, whereas the medallions in the spokes are carved with women in luxurious deposits, largely erotic in nature.
what he referred to the were the countless the phrases of end wind naked the bodies the making the love in the various positions the women the clinging to the necks of men their knees the wrapped eternally around their lovers the thighs in addition to this the were assorted the scenes the from daily life of hunting and trading of deer being the killed with bows and arrows and uh, the march in the warriors the holding the sports in their hands it was the no longer the possible to enter the temple the for it had the field with the rubble is ago the but they admired the exterior the, as they did all the tourists the mr kapasi the brought there the slowly the strolling the along the each of its sides mr das the trail the behind the taking pictures the children the land the head the pointing to finger figures the often naked people intrigued in the particular by the naga mitunas the half the human half uh, serpentine the couples the who were said mr kapasi told them to live in the deepest the waters of the sea mr kapasi was the place that they liked the temple uh, pleased especially that it appealed to mrs das she stopped every three or four paces staring the silently at the cow the lovers the and the processions of elephants and the topless the female the musicians the beating on the two sided drums though mr kapasi had been to the temple the countless times it occurred to him as he too the gaze the, at the topless the women that he had never seen his the own wife the fully naked even when they had made love she kept the panels of her blouse hooked together the string of her petticoat knotted around her waist he had never admired the backs of his the wife's legs the way he now admired the doors of mrs das walking as if for is benefit alone he had of course seen the plainly plenty of bare limbs the before belonging to the american and the european ladies the who took his the tours but mrs das was different unlike the other women who had an interest the only in the temple the and they kept their noses buried in a guide book or their eyes the behind the lens of a camera mrs das they had taken an interest in him um, mr kapasi was anxious that to be along with her to continue the other private conversation yet he felt nervous to walk uh, at her side she was the last to be behind her sunglasses ignoring her husband's request that she paused for another picture walking past the her children as if they were strangers worried that he might disturb her mr kapasi walked ahead to admire as he always did the three life the size the bronze the avatars of surya the sun the god and each image in the from it's the old niche on the temple the facade to greet the sun at dawn noon and evening they wore elaborate uh, headdresses they are languid elongated eyes the close they are bare chest 
wrapped with cowed chains and amulets. Hibiscus the petals, offerings the from the previous the visitors were strewn at their grey green feet. The last the statue on the northern the wall of the temple was uh, Mr. Kapas's the favorite. This uh, Surya had a tired expression. Weary after a hard day of work, the sitting astride a horse with the folded legs, even his the horse's eyes were drowsy. Around his the body were smaller sculptures of women in pairs that their hips thrust to one side. Who is that? Mrs. Dust asked. He was startled to see that she was standing beside him. He is the Astachila Surya, Mr. Kapasi said, the setting sun. So in a couple of hours the sun will set right here. She slipped a foot out of one of her square heeled shoes, rubbed her to uh, toes on the back of her other leg. That is correct. She raised her sunglasses for a moment then put them back on again. Neat. Mr. Kapasi was not certain exactly the, what the word suggested but he had a feeling it was a favorable response. He hoped that Mrs. Das had understood Surya's the beauty, his power. Perhaps they would discuss it further in their letters. He would explain the things to her, things about India, and she would explain the things to him about America in its own way his correspondence would fulfill his the dream of serving as an interpreter between the nations. He looked at her strawberry bag, delighted that his the address lay nestled among its contents. When he pictured her so many uh, thousands of miles away, he plummeted so much so that he had an overwhelming urge to wrap his the arms around her to freeze the with her even for an instant in an embrace the witnessed by his the favorite Surya. But Mrs. Dust had already started walking. When do you return to America? He asked the train to sound placid. In 10 days, he calculated a week to settle in, a week to develop the pictures, a few days to compose her letter, two weeks to get to India by air. According to his scheduled, allowing the room for delays, he would hear from Mrs. Das in approximately six weeks the time. The family was silent as Mr. Kapasi drew them back a little past the 40, uh, 4.30 to Hotel Sandy Villa. The children had bought miniature granite versions of the chariots, the wheels the, at a souvenir stand, and they turned them uh, round in uh, their hands. Mr. Das continued to read his book. Mrs. Das untangled Tina's the hair with her brush and divided it in, into two little ponytails. Mr. Kapasi was the beginning to dread 
the thought of dropping them off. He was not prepared to begin his six-week wait to hear from Mrs. Das as he stole the glances at her in the rear view the mirror. The wrapping elastic the bands around the Tina's the hair. He wondered how he might make the tour last a little longer. Ordinarily, he spent the bag to Puri using a shortcut. Eager to return home, he scrubbed his feet and hands with the sandalwood soap and enjoyed the evening newspaper and a cup of tea that his wife would serve him in silence. The thought of that silence, something to which he would long be in, resigned now the oppressed him. It was then that he suggested visiting the hills at Udayagiri and Khandagiri, where a number of monastic dwellings were horned out of the ground facing one another across a defile. It was some miles away, but well the worth seeing Mr. Kapasi told him. Oh, yeah, there is something mentioned about it in this book, Mr. Das said, built by a Jane the King or something. Shall we go then? Mr. Kapasi asked. He paused at a turn in the road. It is to the left. Mr. Das turned to look at Mrs. Das. Both of them shrugged, left, left, the children that chanted. Uh, Mr. Kapasi turned the wheel uh, almost uh, delirious with the relief. He did not know what he would do or say to Mrs. Das the once they arrived at the hills. Perhaps he would tell her that what a pleasing smile she had. Perhaps he would compliment her strawberry shirt, which he found irresistibly becoming. Perhaps when the Mr. Dust was busy taking a picture, he would take her hand. He did not have to worry when they got to the hills the divided by a steep the part the thick the with the trees mrs das the refused to get out of the car all along the path the dozens of monkeys that were seated on the stones as well as the on the branches of the trees their hind legs the were stretched out in front and raised the to shoulder level, their arms resting on their knees. My legs are tied, she said, sinking low in her seat. I will stay here. Why did you have to wear those stupid shoes? Mr. Das said. You won't be in the pictures. Pretend I'm there. But we could use the one of these pictures for our Christmas the card this year. We didn't get one of all the five of us at the Sun Temple. Mr. Kapasi could take it. I am not coming. Anyway, those monkeys they give me the chips. Crips. But they are the harmless, the Mr. Dar said. He turned to Mr. Kapasi, aren't they? They are more hungry than dangerous, Mr. Kapasi said. Do not provoke them with food, and they will not bother you. Mr. Das headed up. The defiled with the children, the boys at his side, the little girl on his shoulders. Mr. Kapasi watched 
as they crossed the paths with a Japanese man and a woman. The only other tourist there who paused for a final photograph then stepped into a nearby the car and drew away as the car disappeared out of view the some of the monkeys that called out emitting soft whooping sounds and then walked on their the flat the black hands and feet up the path at one point a group of them they formed a little the ring around the mr das and the children tina screamed in delight ronnie ran in circles around his uh, father the bobby bent down and picked up a fat stick on the ground when he extended it one of the monkeys that approached him and snatched it then briefly beat the ground i'll join them mr kapasi said unlocking the door on his side there is the much to explain about the caves no stay a minute mrs das said she got out of the back seat and slipped in beside mr kapasi raj as his dumb the book any anyway together through the wind shield mrs das and mr kapasi watch as the bobby and the monkey the past this stick back and forth between them a brave little boy mr kapasi commented it is not so surprising mrs das said no he is not his i beg your pardon raj he is not raj's son mr kapasi felt prickled on his skin he reached into his shirt pocket for the small tin of lotus oil balm he carried with him at all times and applied it to three spots on his forehead he knew that mrs das was watching him but he did not turn to face her instead he watched as the figures of mr das and the children grew smaller climbing up the steep the path the pausing every now and then the for a picture surrounded by a um, growing the number of monkeys are you surprised the way she put it made him the choose his words with care it is not the type of a thing to one assumes mr kapasi replied slowly he put the tin of lotus the oil the balm the back in his pocket no of course not and no one knows of course no one at all i have kept it a secret for eight whole years she looked at mr kapasi tilting her chin as if to gain a fresh perspective but now i have told you Mr. Kapasi nodded. He felt uh, suddenly parched and his forehead was the warm and slightly numb from the balm. He considered asking Mrs. Das for a sip of water, then decided against it. We met when we were very young, she said. She reached into her straw bag in a search of something then pulled out a packet of a puff rice the one some no thank you she put a fist full in her mouth sank into the seat a little and looked away from mr kapasi out the window on her side of the car 
We married when we were still in college. We were in high school when he proposed. We went to the same college, of course, back then. We couldn't stand the thought of being separated, not for a day, not for a minute. Our parents they were best friends who lived in the same town. My entire life I saw him there every weekend, either at our house or theirs. We were sent upstairs to play the together while other parents jogged about our marriage. Imagine, they never caught us at anything. Though, in a way, I think it was all more or less a setup. The things that we did those the Friday and Saturday nights, while our parents sat downstairs drinking tea, I could tell you stories, Mr. Kapasi. As a result of spending all her the time in the college with Raj, she continued. She did not make many close friends. There was the no one to confide in about him at the end of a difficult day or to share a passing thought or worry. Her parents now lived on the other side of the world, but she had never been very close to them. Anyway, after marrying so young, she was overwhelmed by it all. Having a child so quickly and nursing and warming up bottles of milk and testing their temperature against her wrist while Raj was at work. Dressed in the sweaters and the corduro pants, uh, teaching his students about rocks and di dinosaurs. Raj never looked cross or harried or plumped as she had become after the first boy. Always the tide, she declined the invitations from her, the one or two of the college girlfriends to have the lunch or shop in Manhattan. Uh, eventually, the friends stopped calling her so that she was left at home all day with a baby, surrounded by toys that made her trip when she walked or winced when she sat always the cross and tired. Only occasionally did they go out after Ronnie was born and even more rarely did they entertain. Raj didn't mind. He looked forward to coming home from teaching and watching television and bouncing Ronnie on his knee. She had been outraged when Raj told her that a Punjabi friend, someone whom she had once met but did not remember, would be staying with them for a week for some job interviews in the New Brunswick area. Bobby was conceived in the afternoon on a sofa littered with rubber uh, teething toys after the friend learned that a London pharmaceutical company had hired him while Ronnie cried to be freed from his playpen. She made no protest when the friend touched the small of her back as she was about to make a pot of coffee, then pulled her against his crisp navy suit. He made love to her safely in silence 
with an expertise that she had never known. Without the meaningful expressions and smiles the Raj always insisted on afterward. The next day the Raj drew the friend to JFK. He was the married now to a Punjabi girl and they lived in London still and every year they exchange Christmas cards with Raj and Meena. Each couple tuck in the photos of their families into the envelopes. He did not know that he was the Bobby's the father. He never would. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Das, but uh, why have you told me this uh, information, Mr. Kapasi asked when she had finally finished speaking and had turned to face him once again. For God's sake, stop the calling me, Mrs. Das. I am 28. You probably have the children my age. Not quite. It disturbed Mr. Kapasi to learn that she thought of him as a parent. The feeling he had had toward her that had made him the check his reflection in the in the rear view the mirror as they drew he operated a little. I told you that because of your talents, she put the packet of puff dries the back into her bag without folding over the top. I don't understand, Mr. Kapasi said. Don't you see? For eight years I haven't been able to express this to anybody, not to friends, certainly not to Raj. He doesn't um, even suspect it. He thinks I'm still in love with him. Well, don't you have anything to say about what? About what I have just told you about my the secret and about how terrible it makes me feel. I feel terrible looking at my the children and at Raj, always terrible. I have terrible urges, Mr. Kapasi, to throw uh, things away. The one day I had the urge to throw everything I own out the window, the television, the children, everything. Don't you think it is unhealthy? He was silent. Mr. Kapasi, don't you have anything to say? I thought that the, that was your job. My job is to give to us the Mrs. The Das, not that. Your other job as an interpreter. But we do not face a language barrier. What need is uh, there the foreign interpreter? That is not what I mean. I would never have told you otherwise. Don't you realize the, what it means the, for me to tell you? What does it mean? It means that I am the tired of a feeling so terrible all the time. Eight years, Mr. Kapasi. I have the been in the pain eight years. I was the hoping you could help me feel better. Say the right thing. Suggest some kind of a remedy. He looked at her in her red plaid skirt and a strawberry t-shirt. A woman not yet thirty who loved neither her husband nor her children. Who had already fallen out of love with life. Her confession depressed him, depressed him all the more when he thought of Mr. Das at the top of the path, Tina clinging to his shoulders, the taking pictures of ancient monastic cells that cut into the hills that to show his the students in America unsuspecting and unaware that one of his sons was not his own. 
Mr. Kapasi felt insulted that Mrs. Das should ask him to interpret her common, trivial, the little secret. She did not re resemble the patients in the doctor's office, those who came the glassy eyed and desperate, unable to sleep or breathe or urinate with ease unable above all to give the words to their pains still mr kapasi believed it was his the duty to assist mrs uh, das perhaps he ought to tell her to confess the truth to mr das he would explain that uh, honesty was the best policy honesty Surely they would help her feel better, as she would put it. Perhaps he would offer to preside over the discussion. As a mediator, he decided to begin with the most obvious question to get to the heart of the matter. And so he asked, is it really pain you feel Mrs. Das, or is it guilt? She turned to him and glared, mustard oil the thick on her the frosty pink lips. She opened her mouth to say something, but as she glared at Mr. Kapasi, some certain knowledge seemed to pass before her eyes, and she stopped it crushed him he knew at that moment that he was not even important enough to be properly insulted she opened the car door and began walking up the path wobbling a little on her square the wooden heels reaching into her straw bag to eat handfuls of a puffed rice it fell through her fingers leaving a zigzagging trail uh, causing a monkey to leap down from a tree and devour the little white grains in search of more the monkeys that began to follow mrs das the others that joined him uh, so that she was soon being followed by about a half a dozen of them. The velvety tails the dragon behind. Mr. Kapasi stepped out of the car. He wanted to holler to alert her in some way, but he worried uh, that if she knew they were behind her, she would grow nervous perhaps she would lose her balance perhaps they would uh, pull at her door bag or her hair he began to jog up the path taking a fallen branch in his hand to scare away the monkeys mrs dance that continued walking oblivious uh, trailing grains of puffed rice near the top of the incline before a group of cells fronted by a row of uh, scott stoned pillars. Mr. Dust was the kneeling on the ground focusing the lens of his the camera. The children stood under the arcade now hiding now emerging from view wait for me mrs das the called out i'm coming uh, tina jumped up and down here comes the mummy great mr das said without looking up that just in time that we will get mr kapasi to take a picture of the five of us Mr. Kapasi quickened his pace, the waving his the branch so that the monkeys scampered away, this 
attracted in another direction. Oh, where is the bobby? Mrs. Das asked when she stopped. Um, Mr. Das that looked up the, from the camera. I don't know, uh, Ronnie, where is the bobby? Ronnie shrugged. I thought he was the right here. Where is he? Mrs. Das repeated sharply. What is wrong with uh, all of you? They began to call in his name, the wandering the up and down the path uh, a bit because they were calling. They did not initially hear the boys' screams the when they found him a little the farther down the path under a tree. He was surrounded by a um, group of monkeys, the over a dozen of them. Pulling at his the t shirt with the other long the black the fingers that the puffed rice the Mrs. Dust had spilled was scattered at his the feet, dragged over by the monkeys the hands. The boy was a silent, his body frozen, swift tears uh, running down his uh, startled face. His bare legs were dusty and red with the wells from the where the one of the monkeys struck the him the repeatedly the with the stick he uh, he had given to it earlier. Daddy, the monkeys the hurting Bobby, Tia said. Mister Dust the wiped his the palms the on the front. Uh, front of his shorts. In his uh, nervousness, he accidentally the pressed the shutter on his the camera, the veering noise of the advance in the film excited the monkeys the, and, the, and the one with the stick began to beat Bobby more intently. What are we supposed to do? What if they start attacking? Mr. Kapasi, Mr. Das shrugged, noticing him standing to one side. Do something for God's sake. Do something. Mr. Kapasi took his uh, branch and shooed them away hissing at the ones that remained st stomping his feet to scare them. The animals the retreated slowly with a measured gait, obedient but uh, unintimidated. Mr. Kapasi gathered Bobby in his the arms and uh, brought him the back to where is the parents and siblings to boy standing? As he carried him, he was the tempted to whisper a secret into the boy's ear. But Bobby was stunned and shivering with fright, his legs the bleeding slightly where the stick had broken the skin. When Mr. Kapasi delivered him to his the parents, Mr. Das the brushed some dirt off the boy's the t-shirt and put the visor on him the right way. Mrs. Das the reached into her straw bag to find a bandage which she taped over the cut on his knee. Ronnie offered his the brother a fresh the piece of gum. He is fine, just a little scared, right, Bobby? Mr. Das said, patting the top of his the head. God, let's get out of here, Mrs. Das said. She folded her arms across the strawberry on her chest. This the place that gives me the creeps, yeah. Back to the hotel, definitely, 
Mr. Das agreed. Poor Bobby, Mrs. Das said. Come here a second. Let uh, mommy fix your hair. Again, she reached into her straw bag, this time for her hairbrush, and began to run it around the edges of the translucent visor. When she whipped out the hairbrush, the slip of paper with Mr. Kapasis, the address on it fluttered away in the wind. No one but Mr. Kapasi noticed he watched as it rose, they carried higher and higher by the breeze into the trees where the monkeys the now sat um, solemnly observing the sea in the below mr kapasi observed it too knowing that this was the picture of the dance family he would preserve the forever in his mind